Trying to brew a killer, juicy, hazy IPA? If you're still chasing that explosive wow factor in your hazy IPAs, but they're turning out looking like muddy dishwater, or if that incredible hop aroma just vanishes after a week, it's because you've been focusing on all the wrong things. Forget endlessly tweaking your grain bill and hop combo. The secret to a world-class, line-out-the-door hazy IPA isn't some magic hop combo or one more scoop of oats. I've seen brewers clutch their beersmith and brewfather recipes like sacred scrolls, but the secret is mastering five non-negotiable rules of process and chemistry. In this episode of Quality Focus Pro Brewers, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. This is the blueprint that'll unlock that stable, juicy, explosive hop character you've been chasing. This is where you stop guessing and start engineering greatness. Let's get brewing. G'day brewers, my name is Hendo and I'm a pro brewer coach from the Rockstar Brewer Academy. I help professional brewers all over the world implement their quality systems so they brew amazing world-class beer. Now look, we've all been there. You brew a hazy that looks absolutely perfect in the fermenter. It's a gorgeous pale gold and the aroma is just intoxicating and you're thinking, yeah, this is the one. You package it, feeling damn proud, only to open one a week later and find it's a shadow of its former self. That vibrant colour is now a murky brown. The gorgeous hop aroma is gone, and what was supposed to be a soft, pillowy dream now has this harsh green bitterness. It's one of the most frustrating things in brewing, period. The whole point of a New England IPA isn't just the haze, it's a promise. It's a promise of saturated, juicy, fruity hop character, a soft, creamy mouthfeel, and next to no bitterness. But delivering on that promise consistently? That's the hard part. The style is a tightrope walk of chemistry and biology, and one wrong move sends the whole thing crashing down. Today, we're throwing out the endless recipe tweaks, and we're going to dive deep into the why behind the what. This is about your process. This is about the chemistry and the microbiology. Break these five rules at your own peril because these are the pillars that separate hazies that make you go meh to the truly world-class ones that people actually line up for. Master these and you'll become a better brewer, full stop. So let's get into the first secret, the one that most brewers completely overlook, your water chemistry. Your water is your canvas, not just any ingredient. All right, this is where a lot of brewers just completely drop the ball. Brewers get so laser focused on the hops and the grains that they treat their water as if it's just something that comes out of a tap. This is the single biggest mistake that you can make with this style. Think of your water not as an ingredient, but as the canvas you're about to paint on. If that canvas is garbage, I don't care how good your paints are, the final painting is going to be compromised. Because here's the thing, if you're brewing a hazy that's 6% ABV, it's 94% water. It's literally the most abundant ingredient in your pint glass. Think about it. You've absolutely nailed the hop combo. You're using a mountain of oats, but the beer still has this thin body and a sharp, almost minerally bite to it. And that pillowy softness you're chasing feels more like a myth. Here's what you need to do. You have to take complete control of your water chemistry. Your main target is the sulfate to chloride ratio. For a rockstar level hazy IPA, you need to slam the scale in favour of chloride. A 0.5 or even a 0.3 ratio of sulfate to chloride is a great place to start. And the best way to do this is to start with a blank slate. Reverse osmosis or RO water. Start there and build your perfect water profile from scratch with brewing salts like calcium chloride, epsom salt, gypsum, and even table salt. This is straight up sensory chemistry. Chloride and sulfate do completely opposite things to your palate. Sulfate is what you want in a classic West Coast IPA. It makes the hops taste sharp, bitter, and dry. That's the enemy in this style. Chloride, on the other hand, is your best friend. It makes everything feel fuller, rounder, and softer. It boosts the perception of sweetness and it creates that pillowy mouthfeel that lets the juicy hop flavors pop without getting stomped on by bitterness. I worked as a brewery in Adelaide and they were getting amazing aromas, but the finish was harsh and astringent. We looked at their water report and to be honest, it was some of the most difficult municipal water I've ever had to deal with in my career. I had them switch to RO and build a water profile where the beer pH was 4.4 and the sulfate to chloride ratio was 0.4 and the calcium level was around 80 parts per million. 
The very next batch was a completely different beer. It was luscious, soft, and the juice character was finally able to shine. That beer just won Champion Beer of Show at the recent Royal Adelaide Beer and Cider Awards. Stop leaving your water to chance and don't fall into the trap of cranking your chloride levels to the extreme. It'll only make your beer taste like you're chewing on an aspirin pill and add so much calcium to your water that your yeast will flocculate out and kill your haze. Water's the non-negotiable first step, and if you want to dial in your water chemistry, be sure to check out my free five-step quality checklist by commenting checklist below or heading to rockstarbrewer.com forward slash checklist. Now, the next secret is modern grist engineering. You've got to engineer the haze and the mouthfeel. Okay, so with our soft, pillowy water canvas ready, let's talk about the grist. This secret is realising the grain bill for a hazy isn't just about making sugar for the yeast to eat. It's about bioengineering texture and a stable haze. Forget the old rules about making clear beer. Here, we're building a beautiful permanent cloud from the ground up. But here's the problem. Your beer has a poor haze that just drops out after a week. Or worse, you get that dreaded snow globe look with ugly chunks floating around. The beer feels thin and not creamy. You have to build a grist that's loaded with haze positive proteins. This means a solid chunk of your grain bill, typically around 20 to 30%, needs to be high protein adjuncts like flaked oats, flaked wheat, and malted wheat. And for a secret weapon, consider something like chitmol. It's under modified, so it's packed full of protein. Here's why it works that beautiful, stable haze isn't just yeast, it's a complex matrix of proteins from your grain locking arms with polyphenols from your hops. And so you need to pick your adjuncts properly. Oats, for instance. Flaked oats are your friend for mouthfeel. They're full of beta-glucans, which add viscosity, making the beer feel richer and creamier. And they also bring proteins to the party, which help build haze structure. Wheat is the real protein powerhouse, though. It's packed with the specific types of proteins that are essential for creating a stable, long-lasting haze when they bind with the hot polyphenols. Many brewers find that malted wheat gives a smooth, more stable haze than raw wheat, but for me, I personally like flaked wheat. And then there's this trick that I've seen some of the best hazy brewers use, chit malt. It's an undermodified malt that's basically a protein bomb. It can give you incredible head retention and adds another layer of stability to your haze. A brewery I know in Victoria was struggling with their haze dropping clear, so they added about 5% chit malt to their grist and then boom, permanent haze. Beautiful haze that wouldn't quit. And finally, your mash matters. A high mash temp, say around 67 to 69 degrees Celsius, that's 152 to 156 in freedom units, leaves more unfermentable sugars behind, which means more body and a touch of sweetness. You're not just following a recipe, you're the architect of your beer's texture and appearance. And the next secret, intelligent hopping. Think biotransformation and temperature control. So now we get to the star of the show, the hops. But here's the hard truth, the next secret, creating that explosive hop aroma that isn't about using more hops, it's about using them smarter. The best hazy IPAs out there use a multi-layered, temperature-aware hopping plan designed to unlock flavors through smart chemistry and biology. But here's the problem. Your beer smells incredible coming out of the fermenter, but that aroma falls off a cliff in two weeks. Or you've dry hopped the hell out of it and all you got was a nasty green astringent hop burn that scrapes your tongue. You need a cooler whirlpool and a smart two-stage dry hop. One charge goes in during active fermentation, about three quarters of the way through fermentation, and the second goes in right at terminal gravity just as a final polish. Firstly, the whirlpool. The days of really hot whirlpools at 95 degrees Celsius are over for this style. High heat rips a lot of bitterness out of those hops and flashes off the most delicate, beautiful aromas. By dropping your whirlpool temperature to about 75 to 85 degrees Celsius, that's about 167 to 185, you get all the amazing flavor and aroma compounds from your hops with a fraction of the harsh bitterness. It's a total game changer. Next, dry hopping. A two-stage attack is key. DDH is king in this style. The first one is going to be your biotransformation hop. You add this charge after peak fermentation, typically about five or six days in. This is where the real magic happens. Your yeast has enzymes that can actually interact with flavorless compounds in the hops, such as bound thiols and glycosides, 
to transform them into incredibly potent fruity new aromas. It creates those complex, juicy notes of citrus, passion fruit, and guava that you simply can't get any other way. And don't fall into the trap of adding your biotransformation dry hop too early. Longer contact time can extract those gross, grassy, vegetal aroma and flavors from your hops, and your haze will also suffer. Wait, and you will be rewarded. And then the second dry hop charge usually goes in after the beer hits its final gravity. The fermentation is done, so there's no CO2 scrubbing away all that goodness. This charge is all about that fresh, in-your-face aromatic punch. It's the top note, that final polish. Now, I know that talented brewers like Scott Janish swear by soft crashing their beer to 14 degrees Celsius or 57 Fahrenheit before dry hopping. And look, I get it. Removing yeast cells prior to dry hopping will see less of those aroma compounds being absorbed by yeast cells. But I simply can't accept the risk of hop creep that comes with it. The yeast is below its optimal operating temperature and may not be able to ferment out the newly formed fermentable sugars from hop creep efficiently or deal with the diacetyl that's inevitably produced. What works for me is dry hopping during the diacetyl rest phase, testing for diacetyl, and then, and only then, cold crashing. But hey, your mileage might vary, that's okay. But even with the strategic dry hopping plan, you still have to manage that vegetal hop material. Hop burn is that harsh, astringent taste of tiny hop particles suspended in your beer. To fight this, you need a solid separation plan. About 24 to 36 hours after each dry hop charge, dump the settled hops from the cone out of your fermenter. This gets a ton of that harsh green matter out. And before you package, give the beer plenty of time to settle. And if you're still getting that hop burn after all that, consider using a coarse filter or a centrifuge if you can afford one during your final transfer. This can be a last resort to remove those particles without stripping out the good stuff. And rousing your dry hops? Some brewers swear by it, others don't see the point. You do you, but don't overdo the rousing because you'll extract those grassy vegetal notes that you definitely don't want in a hazy IPA. Hopping this style is all about being strategic. It's not just throwing pellets at the problem. All right, we're getting deep into the science of hazy beers. So if these tips are helping you build a better hazy from the ground up, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button We've got two more massive secrets to cover, including the number one killer of this style, so you don't want to miss it. Your support helps me keep making videos like this one. Now, let's get to the next secret. The yeast is your flavor engine. You can nail the water, the grist, and the hops, but if you pick the wrong yeast, you're dead in the water straight from the start. This secret is about realizing that for a New England IPA, your yeast isn't just a supporting actor, it's the lead co-star. It's an active flavor engine that creates the juice and drives the magic of biotransformation. But here's the thing, you've done everything else by the book, but the final beer just tastes mm, flat. The hop flavor is there, it's just not well integrated. It lacks that vibrant, juicy pop. You have to use haze positive yeast known for low flocculation, high ester production, and good biotransformation properties. Genetically, you're looking for the IRC7 gene, but if you can and are able, because we can't here in Australia, you might consider putting this on steroids with those new GMO engineered thiolized yeast strains. Forget clean American ale strains like US05 and 1056 or Chico, they're designed to be invisible. For hazies, you want the character. English strains like AEB Firma Ale New E, London Ale 3, London Fog or Verdant IPA are famous because they don't drop out of the beer easily, contributing to the haze. But more importantly, they pump out the fruity esters, aromas of peach and apricot. These esters fuse with hop aromas to create that perception of juice. It's the synergy. It's like 1 plus 1 equals 3. But now there's a new frontier, thialized yeast. Thiols are those ridiculously potent tropical aroma compounds. Think passion fruit, guava, and grapefruit. Hops and malt have them, but they're in bound form, locked up and flavorless. Thialized yeast strains have been engineered with a gene that lets them act like a key, unlocking these precursors and releasing a tidal wave of tropical aroma. It can boost these flavors to levels that were impossible before. We can't get these thialized yeast strains here in Australia due to the GMO ban, but if you've ever worked with them, let me know how they went for you in the comments below. I'd really love to hear. So here's the thing, 
Most hazy brewers get hung up on the thiols in New England IPA. And don't get me wrong, they're great. But don't forget about the terpenes. Think citrus and floral aroma and flavor. There's more than one biotransformation going on during fermentation, so don't forget about the biotransformation of glycosides into terpenes. Of course, none of this works if your yeast is stressed. Pitch the right amount of yeast, give it the right temperature, and use the right nutrients. And for the love of God, please don't pressure ferment your hazy unless you like hop volcanoes when you dry hop. Your yeast is the engine. Choose it wisely and treat it right. And now we need to avoid the cold side pitfalls. Congratulations, you've done it. You've brewed a masterpiece. It's in the tank, looking and tasting perfect. You're almost at the finish line. And this is where more amazing hazy IPAs die than anywhere else. The next secret is a fanatical, obsessive control over your cold side. It's a trinity. Kill oxygen, manage your beer pH, and control hop creep. The beer that was brilliant gold in the tank turns a brown cardboard flavored mess in a week after you package it or it becomes a gusher in the can and the flavor falls off a cliff. Here's what you gotta do. You gotta adopt a zero tolerance policy for oxygen. Nail your final beer pH and have a plan to deal with hop creep. Dissolved oxygen is the enemy. Hazy IPAs are the most oxygen sensitive beers on the planet. Dissolved oxygen is a serial killer. It murders your hop aroma and it replaces it with the taste of wet cardboard. It turns your beautiful beer brown, just like when you cut an apple in half and leave it on the kitchen bench. We're talking parts per billion of dissolved oxygen, doing irreversible damage. And as we say at the Rockstar Brewer Academy, this means think small, act big to deal with it. Find every little nook and cranny where air can hide, that's think small, and purge it excessively with CO2, that's act big. The pH of your final beer is huge. If you've done the Master Brewing Water Chemistry module at the Rockstar Brewer Academy, you'd know that beer pH is one of the three flavor numbers that makes up a water profile. You wanna be in the 4.3, 4.4 range. This makes the flavors pop and keeps the beer from tasting flabby or weirdly sweet. It also helps lock in that beautiful haze. I saw a brewery's haze turn into a flabby, muddy mess and their final pH was 4.8, believe it or not. Getting it down to 4.4 made it crisper, brighter and more stable. Hop creep is when enzymes in your dry hops start a secondary fermentation. This is a disaster in a can. It creates overcarbonation and that dreaded buttery off flavor diastole. As I said before, I'm personally not a fan of soft crushing before dry hopping, so I choose to hold the beer warm for a few days after the final dry hop, letting any hop creep happen in the tank where the yeast can clean up the mess before as opposed to in the package when it will become an overcarbonated diacetyl bomb. Sure, it's an extra step, but it's the difference between a stable beer and a ticking time bomb that tastes like butterscotch. Mastering this cold side trinity is what separates the pros from the amateurs. It ensures the masterpiece you brewed actually makes it into the glass. When brewing hazy IPA, the theme of connecting all of them is a shift from just following a recipe to taking absolute control of your process. And that includes mastering your water chemistry, engineering the right grist, hopping intelligently, leveraging yeast and biotransformation, and cold side control. And if you want to hear the story about how good process led to Australia's champion beer out of 2,400 beers, be sure to check out my free crash course by commenting crash course below or heading to rockstarbrewer.com forward slash crash course. Because the truth is, getting just one of these secrets wrong can sink your beer. But when you get all five working together, the results are spectacular. You create a beer that's not just great on day one, but stays vibrant and stable for weeks. You create a beer people will remember and line up out the door for. Hey, if you liked this episode, I reckon you should check out this one next. Thanks heaps for tuning in to this episode of Quality Focus Pro Brewers, and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.